Man, it is an honor and a pleasure to be sitting here with a legend today on our podcast, The Player's Perspective Uncensored, uh, with Larry O'Bannon. I'd like to welcome man Greg Miner to the podcast. G, welcome into the podcast, my man. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. It's been a oh, pleasure. Oh, man, no doubt, no doubt. Let, let me ask you this. You went to the University of Louisville, and, you know, in Kentucky, obviously, bourbon is a big thing. Did you ever get a chance to try any bourbon uh, when you were in Kentucky? Um, I did. I did. I think I remember, um, not during my years of playing, but maybe when I was um, playing in the league back then, but um, I did, but I'm not a big bourbon drinker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, let, let's, dive, well let, let's dive right into the podcast, man. And I want to ask you, when you were coming up, you're from Sandersville, Georgia. Who was somebody that you wanted to imitate or somebody that really inspired you when you were coming up? when you were younger? Well, it's, it's you know, when I, I was a football guy growing up, and when I first started watching basketball, I can recall the Lakers and the Celtics series and how I was rooting for the Lakers and watching Showtime. Um, Lakers playing against the Bird Celtics, and there were a couple of kids, so, you know, community rooting for the Celtics. And ironically, I ended up going there. But to answer your question, um, I think guys in my era, a lot of us um, was leaning. For me, it was always Jordan or Magic. You know, um, I really admired what their play, and um, yeah, I, I, I think that's part of the reason why I chose number twenty-three. Or I wanted to number twenty-three when I first went to U of L. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice. Now, you were coming up in high school. You were a parade all-American. What made you choose the University of Louisville? That's a very good question. Um, so my high school coach is from Orangeburg, Kentucky. And he was very influ influ um, inspirational to me um, from decision making to whatever that was like life lessons, even to this day, we, we still have a pretty good relationship. So. Um, he's from Lawrenceboro, and I can recall going to several universities, and they all were football schools. And U of L was one of the schools that I went to that was a basketball school. So he just made it to a point and, and asked me and said, just trust me and just take the visit and let you know what you think. And because at that time, at a particular time, I was going to the University of Georgia. I was hired. I was their number one recruit. <laughs> and... Um, I was dating, I was in love with the assistant coach daughter. Uh, we both played basketball and, and, you know, I was fine with the family. So after my U of L visit, it, it went from being <laughs> fun with the family to choosing this school. And I can remember the, the reaction that the guy I got from them. They were really upset with me, but let's just say that we didn't have senior, we didn't go to senior prom. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. Now, now, let me ask you this. At what point did you switch from football to basketball? Because you said you were a football player. At what point did you switch and know that basketball was going to be your sport? Okay. So, I was, um, I was a freshman, freshman high school. Um, all through middle school up to my ninth grade year, I was a short guy. I was, when I say short, my position, I played running. I was a running back. And so... I think from five, I went from five, eight to six, three. And during that time, um, they switched my position from learning back to tight end. Mm -hmm. And here I am, this tall, skinny kid, in, in the, what we call like a dummy play, which is three step drop. And we had a high passer, um, a younger guy named Chris, Chris Taylor. And um, they lined the, def the defenders on the one side and the offensive players on the other. And it's a three step drop. And we had to come across the middle to make that Chris, I had to come across the middle for Chris to make that pass. And I could never, I would never forget the guy's name, name Cedric Hooks. And he was the best player, the best hitter on the team. And um, I jumped, it was a high pass, I jumped, and man, he hit me right smack in the middle, right in my stomach. And I laid down, I, laid, I jumped, and he hit me right there. And I laid down, I looked, I said, okay, where am I, where am I? Got up, and by, when I walked back to the huddle, I knew I was done. <laughs> <laughs> done with this right there. So, because it's, it was one of those deals where, you know, I had got the wind knocked out of me for the first time and I didn't like to feel it. 
and I can only imagine what it would be like going down the road. So, yeah, that's but, usually what happens. But, I, man. <laughs> but ironically, we had some really good football players come through our, come to, uh, come through that program. We had uh, probably about four or five guys that went on to play for the NFL. Um, Tequil Spice, Robert Edwards, um, Terry Jones are some of the few guys. That, uh, Terrence Edwards, um, those were the guys that came through my high school um, that went on to play in the NFL. And then you had Herschel Walker that lived right down the street. I mean, literally 10 minutes down the road. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Hold on one second. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so the same thing sort of happened to me, man. I was a two-sport athlete, um, and ironically, I didn't even like football. I didn't want to play football. My dad made me play football, and once I got out there, man, I loved it. I just didn't like the all the hitting drills that we did in practice, but I loved to play, man, and similar thing happened to me. I was playing wide receiver. I played all positions and hit a growth spurt. I was like 6'2", switched me to wide receiver, and, man, we were in practice, and – we had this drill where we had to do a crossing route. And man, I caught it in the, caught it in the cross, coming across the middle, man, God just hit me and slammed me right on my shoulder. And man, talking about pain and walking back to the huddle. Like you said, I, I knew this wasn't it for me. This, this is not the direction <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> this is not it's it like for me. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was it for me. I just stuck to the indoor sport after that. <laughs> but uh, what I want to ask you next is, you knew if you didn't go to Louisville, you were going to Georgia. And so once you got to Louisville, you had to sit out your freshman year. Hmm. And w that was a Prop 48? Yeah, back then we had the Prop 48. I had what, you know, I think athletes or students back then, student athletes back then, they either had the, um, the grade or test score. In my case, I didn't have the test score. I had the grades. And so I think the way... I think we, he was in Dwayne Morton was in the same situation. So there were three of us that set out that year. And uh, that was a very difficult time for sure, because it was my first time ever being away from the sport or the game itself. And to be just a full time student and to watch your teammates carry on, <clears throat> go, go about their business, where going to class and um, playing, uh, starting their college careers, it was very, very challenging from a point of where you thought about, like, okay, if I'm going to stick this out, what's the best solution, how should I go about things. Um, but it really made me focus on, on school itself um, and and to get out, out, of, out of my element because I went from being this really quiet guy. And then at that particular time, I still was sort of quiet to to interact with a lot of the other students and really develop a friendship through on campus. So it was a very learning, it was a very good learning experience for me, but um, and it was very trying. It was a it was a trying time because I can remember like calling home, um, speaking with my high school coach. He was one of the, one of the one of, the, one of the, the people who was a very inspirational to me. And then also my um, um, coach Broxton, who was the assistant coach, and also who's a pastor right now. So it was like those two guys that really pushed me through, along with my mom because she was there too. And um, I never give her enough credit, but she was there too. Um, you know, maybe her words, she didn't know what to go through because she, she's a woman that didn't want me to play sports anyway. She actually, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That, that don't, and she got the two sports backwards. So she, <laughs> so she said, uh, don't come crying to me if you get hurt when I first start playing basketball. I'm like, hey, but football is, is a sport. Right. <laughs> so it was one of those deals. So I called those three. Uh, they were very inspirational to me to um, stick it out, and that's what I did. Did you ever think about going the JUCO route? No. No, no never thought uh, about that? Never crossed your no, mind? No, I was just so sold in. Like once I committed to the University of Louis Louisville, and I, I was, um, you know, that was my loyalty. I think, I think I'm one of those guys that, you know, it's funny, like when you watch the game now, and not that I, the players, it doesn't really care about the players or what they do now, but – I think guys in my area tend to stick it through whatever decision they make them most times. So that's what I was going through instead of just going making the JUCO route. I, I couldn't really see myself going that way. Right, right. Now, what were some of your fondest memories when you were playing in the Cardinal uniform? Well, I think <laughs> playing on the Coach Crumb, we spent a lot of time um, 
the night, the night before the games um, in the hotels, which was close to Free Mall. Mm-hmm. And I think when he, when we asked that question, now I'm quite sure there will be other different different ones that come up. I mean, other different visions that come up. But when right now it's being in a hotel the night before the game, being around your teammates and getting that having that stare, especially if you come from a small town um, such as I have, and when you go from something like that and then you go to stay in the hotel before a game and you see the arena like literally across the street and, and the food that's served over there was really good. I was back there. That's what I was eating. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like just really, you know, packing on pounds and laying in the hotel room watching watching TV and, and interacting with the guys. And it was a, it was a really good experience. But also, I think – coming down the ramp and, and going up the ramp from those games too. Um, where you have fans cheering you on as you're walking into, um, walking into the court and walking away from the court. Those are some of the fondest memories. And then now, obviously, as I continue to talk on, I have visions of us when we were like on the road and I was with James Perer or uh, uh, about to say Tremaine Winfield, you know, with Drew. Um, I don't think he would have played, but we used to call each other, call each other the road dogs. And so when we went on the road, whether we went all black card uniforms or when we were wearing our, um, away uniforms, it was it was nothing more to silent crowds when on a key shot or when we actually just executed and playing really well. Nothing like it, man. And it, I, I would say for me, that's one thing that I miss about sports too is – you know, you enjoy the competitiveness and, and getting a chance to compete, but the, the camaraderie, you know, is what yeah. you miss the most, especially in college. You know, when you go to professional, very <laughs> rarely do you have that camaraderie. Everybody's coming in, handling their business, and, and then it's everybody going about their own way. But, you know, in college, you practice together. You stay in your dorms close to each other. You're always doing things together. That's probably the one thing I miss about uh, college. Oh, the finest have you, as well. Have you – did you know – when did you – when did you decide that you wanted to go to U of L? Were there other schools around, or um, were you always sight? Like, was that the school of your dreams? What, 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 nah, how did it play you, out for you? For me, man, I grew up. I was a. Um, excuse me, my microphone's acting up here. Um, I grew up a UConn fan. I always wanted oh. to go to UConn. Anybody that knows me, I was. You know, I, I watched Louisville. I, I was always a Louisville fan, but my diehard dream was to go to UConn. Uh, you know, I wanted to go to UConn. I was a big Ray Allen fan. Still am a big Ray Allen fan, but I wanted to, you know, be like Ray Allen and go to UConn. But uh, going to Louisville was was great. I love Louisville. I lo- like I said, I love watching you guys, Dwayne Morton, Dewan Wheat, Jason Osborne. Uh, some of my fondest memories watching you guys, I remember vividly. I can't remember the team. I want to say uh, Boise State, I think. I remember at the end of the game, Jason Osborne throwing an alley oop pass to you off the backboard, you dunking it backwards. You know, some those are some of my fondest memories. But to go back to answer your question, um, I wasn't getting recruited when Denny Crum was at Louisville. I wasn't getting recruited by Louisville. I was getting recruited by Tennessee. I was getting recruited by Dayton, Colorado. Uh, Coach Larry Gay was out of Colorado. He was uh, recruiting me there. Um, University of Alabama, Birmingham, um, UMass, a few other schools. But I was pretty much set on going to uh, Tennessee. And then uh, I was going to sign in the spring. And coach got fired after the season. And so the new coach came in and, you know, they wanted to go a different route. And so I was about to go to Dayton. And then Rick Pitino had came in. We're going to get to Rick Pitino a little bit later. And uh, he had came in, man, and and came and watched me play in the open gym because he was looking to build, you know, the program back up at Louisville. And when he came and watched me play, man, I didn't even play well. But he knew I was a great athlete, good student, good kid. And so he took a chance on me, man, and uh, ended up working out. It was some rough patches in there, but it ended up working yeah. out in the end, though. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> and so that's, that's, that's how it worked out for me. So have you had a chance to watch the cards play recently in years, or do you get a chance to watch them when they're playing on TV? Well, it, it, it's when I first moved to Florida, I used to watch catch a lot of the games. Um, we are talking about 20 years ago, um, 20, 20, 
more than years ago. Um, and then sporad- I watch, get, I catch a game here and there because at that particular time I start like I, w- I actually went back to school and I um, got my degree. I was doing it online, then opposed to going back to to U of L. And I also was um, doing other other business businesses um, from doing real estate and just some other things too. So, and then I got into coaching. So I was catching games here and there. Um, but and then and when I was overseas, uh, I, I worked in China for about I went like three three different terms, and so it was very difficult to watch. But whenever there are a game a game on, or if I can catch a game here and there, I'm definitely on it. And I was watching it, and actually <clears throat> watching you play was really good. Was really good too, because I remember you know I'm like whoa, this is, it got real so much better, way better than I ever thought. But man, you had an excellent career, so I enjoy watching you play as well and from afar. And yeah, and I was a, and I was a fan uh, with your your group. Um, so I I catch a game here and there, but since I've been out in California for the last three or four years, I have been watching you know um, from afar. Um, Chris Mack, whenever the games because of the you know Saturdays or whatnot, but. Um, um, and I'm glad to see that the program is going in the right direction and where they, you know, I'm excited to see where they're going to be in the next three or four years from now. And that's honestly, when we first met, I remember we had played Xavier in the NCAA tournament. We played down in Orlando and uh, yeah. I can't remember who it was, but somebody said, Greg Miner wants to speak to you. And I was kind of down because we had just lost after the game. I didn't play well. And I'm like, man and so i was like oh, okay greg minor wants to and so i just remember man you calling me into the room man and you just talking to me and just giving me some encouraging words and uh, i really appreciated that man and it was the first time i had ever met you and so i was excited just to meet you uh the first hand but uh for you man to just you know give me some encouraging words man that was, that was big especially uh at that moment so man so definitely uh thank you for that yeah, you're welcome <laughs> yeah Pleasure. It was a pleasure. You know, anything I can do that, you know, it's hard to when you're losing. And so people don't understand when you're losing those games sometimes, especially if you have hopes of going to the finals and winning and all. That's your own only thing. And when you fell short, it's just like it's devastating. And if there's anything that I can do to help, you know, you or players or, you know, any other players that would help me, or we were family. So that's the way I sort of look at things. <laughs> right, right, right. And so in 1994, you got drafted in the first round by the LA Clippers. But then you ended up with the Boston Celtics. How did that come about getting drafted by the Clippers, but ended up with the Boston Celtics? Okay. Um, very good questions. Question. Um, and you actually have very good questions. Um, it's weird how that whole thing played out. I re- I can recall, you know, playing the whole tournament, playing myself in a position to get drafted in the first round, because initially, um, I was projected to go in the second round. Mm-hmm. So um, after those, um, now at this time, was it still three rounds in the draft, or was it down to two at that time? I, was, I think it was two. Down to two? two. Okay. Yeah, I think it was two. And um, I was told by Marty Blake that I maybe want to go to the Chicago camp. And, but I, was, I listened to my agent, Lynn Emmore, at the time, so I decided not to. So, which leads up to the draft, the night of being drafted. Um, I worked out with Indiana that night, um, the day of the draft. And I went back. So I'm thinking all the teams that I, um, like San Antonio to Indiana, I think there was a couple other teams that I had, like from mid, from early to later first round. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking anywhere between from 13, from 13 to the 20th pick or 25th pick, I'm thinking um, those teams were, 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 you know, would be out high on my board. And Parkovich basically said to me that um, he didn't think I would be around. And at that particular time, I think the Spurs were high 20s, I mean, 22nd, 23rd. He didn't think I would be around. So 
um, the coming back from the, the, the um, uh, interview with the Pacers, um, I was in my apartment. We had like a little draft party and I had some close friends of mine there. And uh, we we basically chatting and watching this draft. So I'm getting my high so up and then going low. And here I am getting, I finally get selected by a team that I didn't, <laughs> I didn't even go. I didn't even go to LA. I didn't even work out for the Clippers or anything like that. So it was interesting that it happened that way. And so when the Clippers traded me, I got a phone call right away saying that I was going to, I mean, I got it when Cliff, the dra Cliff, Clippers drafted me. I got a phone call right away saying that uh, they're going to get traded to Indiana. So that's exactly what happened. So we got traded to Indiana. <clears throat> and um, weeks later, uh, I became a restricted free agent because Larry Brown, at that particular time, the Pacers. Uh, were competing for the conference, Eastern Conference um, Championship, and they were, you know, pretty hot, and they wanted a veteran team, and I was one of the younger guys. But they uh, kept Damian Bailey, who was an IU guy, came out um, the same year as I, and they um, signed Dwayne Farrell. So that became – so I became a um, restricted free agent. And, and so moving forward, uh, yeah, I had to look for work and look for a job. And, and so, and went, but what happened, even though you were drafted in the first round, you still didn't have a guaranteed contract? How did that work? No, I signed. I hadn't signed right away. So this, all this thing happened like on draft night. So drafted by the Clippers, traded to the Pacers. The Pacers didn't, the Pacers didn't sign me, right? So we went, I said weeks, but we went probably months before I, month before I got a chance to, but I knew that it was, it was going to happen. I just, just saw a matter of time. So the only two, the team, the two teams that were interested at that particular time was Chicago and Boston. And Jordan was in retirement. It had been really cool to go there. Um, I did get, uh, I did work out for Chicago. Um, that was one of the teams on the, on the list. And um, they offered me one year deal, whereas the Celtics offered me a 10 year deal. And that's the difference. I'm like, okay. And when I talked it over when, but the only difference between the two is, the monies and the monies with the boss with Boston was 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 like a pay cut versus with the the Bulls. So uh, with fault with the Celtics versus the Bulls, and so that's what that was my decision. So I ended up, ended up in Boston because of that. So I went from being drafted to becoming an unrestricted free agent to looking for work to actually get signed <laughs> by the Celtics, a team that I didn't have, the team that didn't have any. I wasn't even on their draft board. Wow. Right? Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's a crazy draft story. And so you played for the Celtics 1996. You're competing in the 1996 dunk contest. How was that experience competing on that stage where, you know, everybody's watching and focused on that all-star <laughs> weekend? You don't realize how um, all the the details, all the things that you go through and with the with that experience. What, what I mean by that is, you know, you're in the dome um, when it's just you on the floor, your attention's on with, uh, with the other players, but when it's you by yourself, then you realize like, whoa, I'm out here by myself, no one else. So that itself kind of feels weird and you're, all the attention is on you. And so you got to take that into consideration. And when you're also when you're going up for a dunk, the background of the, of, of, of the arena, and you don't think about that either. People are snapping cameras. You know, oh, the cameras yeah. so so when you're jumping, I, re I remember my first time attempting the dunk. And the first one, I was like, okay, I just want to make an easy one just to get nine, you know, get warmed up. And <clears throat> and I can remember jumping and, and all those flashes of those, those flashes <laughs> in the behind me. <laughs> and so that, and I got a little nervous because now I'm watching my performance. So, okay, I got to come up with something different. And then I'm watching other guys who probably, they are nervous too. Like Darren Armstrong, he did, he went in for <laughs> three quarters of court. And he did you know, he did he did I mean, yeah, it was like, uh, I don't know, it wasn't a dunk, but it was like a layup <laughs> pretty much. Right, uh, he did the finger roll. <laughs> <laughs> but it's one of those things so where you got the cameras, you got guys nervous, and then you, you plan into the whole thing. And I think like, 
if you really look at the guys who are showmen, who embrace the crowd, those are the ones that uh, that win the, win the dunk contest. And it was tough, too, because it wasn't like you had to do one dunk, get a chance to rest your legs to the next dunk. You had to do, like, three or four dunks straight in a row. So, like, you know, if you're missing and then you're trying to complete these three dunks, your legs can get tired. And I think you were on, like, a, a minute clock to be able to try to fit these dunks in. So it was a, it was a tough, <laughs> you know, tough uh, – Way to put the put it put it into the dunk contest, man. Having to put absolutely. all those restrictions in. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah, it's a it's a time restriction thing. I think I can I can recall, but I think and you're right. And it was like three dunks you can get within those time. And I think they took their best dunk and they got it the Italian score. But um, I can recall like you know um, having to finish it and having played. So I'm like, well, at least I wasn't knocked out of the first, you know, the first <laughs> week. <laughs> yeah, but it was a fun night, great experience. I had uh, some of my friends come up, um, college buddies come up and and uh, and watch, get get a chance to experience that thing. And um, it was good for, you know, all of us. Um, even when I say college buddies, they were really like guys that are new from Louisville um, that I still keep in contact with to, to this day. So it was good for all of us to uh, – to have them see that, experience that as well. So Nice, nice. Yeah. Now, by this time, Mike's come back into the league. Tell me mm -hmm. about your first experience playing against Michael Jordan uh, in a Boston Celtic uniform. I, I want to, if memory serves me correctly, I think we were in, we, we were actually went to Chicago to play there. And, you know, I just going into that arena and, to take everything again, you know, um, the, the bull logo in the center of the floor to the locker room, to the way to the court, um, way to the, the arena period. It was a very good experience. And I, I think like you, you, you just felt like the team, you can just feel the confidence of the team because they have won so many games. And then they have the best player to ever to go, the guys that ever played the, the best that ever played the game, in my opinion. Um, so it was, it, was, it was a great experience, but I, could, I wasn't nervous. I wasn't afraid. I almost like I was ready for the moment, but I didn't actually play that game um, um, my rookie year. But it was, um, it was a great experience to listen to the, all the older guys, um, the way they approach. Uh, and it's weird because Back during those times when we played against Jordan, he had Shaq and all this. Whoever had guarded those guys those night at those at that time, they are serious. They, right. <laughs> <they> <laughs> around, it was none of that. It was it was like okay, I got Mike tonight. Y'all leave me alone, leave me alone. Let me focus on what I need to do. That kind of deal. So I'm back there just taking everything in. Like okay, let's see who's going to do what. And uh, D Brown and David Wesley. Blue Edwards, Jay Humphreys, those guys got a lot of it that night. <laughs> Ooh, a lot of trash talking too, I bet, boy. Probably so, probably so. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you first went to Boston, you were playing for Coach Chris Ford. Mm -hmm. But then 1997, 98, Coach Patino takes over the Boston Celtics, comes mm -hmm. in as the new coach. What was the change? I talk about that experience going from Coach Ford to Coach Patino coming in, uh, being the head coach of the Boston Celtics. Okay, well, it's it like Chris was there my my rookie year. His his style of coaching was very hard and old, very old school. Um, really got on the guy's skin at times. Um, got on the mind, but I, um, but I took his words as words of encouragement uh, more so than personal. Um, so, and I understood that was my fault because, and I'm going to take walk you through this. Like with, with Chris, I, under him, I, I wasn't quite learning how to be a pro yet because like in, in college, we probably just started at, let's say three and I'm there at 250 and I have enough time to get on the floor and it's cool. Right. But in pros, if it's at three, you might want to be there an hour earlier. And I didn't grasp that right away. And so um, he had a talk with me, and, and uh, <laughs> let's just say that I, I, my mind shifted really quick. <laughs> and so instead of being there an hour, and I was there probably about an hour and 45 minutes early every day, sometimes I'd two hours early. 
Um, and thanks for guys like Sherman Douglas and, and Xavier McDaniels, and guys that guys who took me under their wing, wings and, and also Purvis on Purvis Ellison was also on the team too. But I was mainly hung with Sherman, Sherman Douglas and, and then Xavier McDaniels. And, and those two guys uh, really showed me the ropes of what I needed to do. And by that time I started, I was starting to play a little bit more. Um, but Doc, Chris is, um, we call him Doc, is, uh, his way was more team structure. Like everything we did within this confine of the team, it wasn't player development as well. And that's what Rick was different in, in terms of um, with Doc. I think with Rick, it was more, I can recall uh, coming off an injury and um, receiving a, a letter from, from a mentor like practice. And I remember going to this, being the only one in there. And there were all the entire coaching staff there. And he took me through a series of drills. And this, mind you, this is my first time actually coming back and trying mm-hmm. to have, I had fractured my foot. Yeah, <laughs> I can see your face now. So before, um, I would say like 15, no, maybe a half an hour in, next thing I'm over, and I never have done this before in my life, I'm over there leaning over the tr- garbage can early just vomiting all over the place so and that didn't feel good but I was um I was pretty it was pretty eye-opener for me and we we bumped heads we bumped heads on a lot of things some of some of the things that you know I think in terms of my his his personality versus my personality I was not a pushover and I was quiet I tried to be I tried to do things within the team rules but it was a learning experience because now I had I was with a, a coach that really didn't didn't um, how can I say didn't see the things didn't see looked at me from a different lens. So I had right. to, I had to, I had to learn to adjust to that kind of behavior and then uh, move forward. That's basically what it, that's basically what our things went with, with, with me and Rick. And the crazy thing about the whole thing is that we were born on the same day. Wow, <laughs> wow, wow! Sounds that's like a familiar. Enough. Sounds like a familiar story, man. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a familiar yeah. story. And so, one of the stories, and I got to say this, I, I, I have to say this, and this is the thing that um, that bothered me, that bothered me for years, and I can recall. We were playing Chicago. Um, this is when Jordan came out of retirement. And this is our first year back. And then this is the thing I need to see. When I also want to talk, speak to Chelsea Bill because all this feelings coming up in my mind. <laughs> Chelsea Bill was a rookie, but I'm going to share the story with you. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm in the locker room and uh, I'm walking in, into the building, in, into my locker room practice facility at Brandeis University. And I'm one of the last one there. You know, I have all this outside distraction, you know, that's going on at the time. And my life is in like shambles, pretty much, pretty much. And I'm trying to sort my way through it. So I'm walking through the lock, I'm walking through the, the hall, away to the locker room. And before I even get to the locker, Johnny, I think it was Johnny Joe, he's equipment man, he said, Coach Patino would like to see you. And I said, okay. So I'm going to grab my things. I put my things down. I'm like standing there and guys were getting taped and all this stuff. And it, it was, he wanted to see me from a prior interview I gave before the, the game in Chicago. Um, it, was, it was on the Saturday and played Chicago on a Friday night. Mm-hmm. And he goes, Greg, man, I don't give a fuck who you say you are and all this stuff in front of Chris Avar and, and Chris Wallace. And this is around the time when Latrell Spreewell had choked. <laughs> right. So I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm like, okay. All right. He's saying all this stuff. Now he's thinking he, he got these two guys here. And I'm thinking, okay, he think I wanna he's trying to either provoke me or he's trying to he doesn't really know me, he think I'm gonna attack him. So he used all these vulgar words at me, right? Right. And I'm looking, I'm like, okay. And it took me, listen, it took me so much to just not to say anything and just bite my tongue. And so that's what I did. I went inside and all the, by this time, all the guys that went up, we on the, they're on the second floor. That's where we watch all the film, film session. And they're on the second floor and I went and changed and I didn't really want to go in there because now I'm heated. 
right? And so as I'm walking, as he's walking upstairs from our meeting, he starts screaming on the top of his lawn, tell trying to threaten me, like use this whole like authoritarian figure, like as if he's making me little than what I am. I get this for lack of a better word. Right. So I walk so I walk upstairs and, and I'm the last one in. And then the next thing you go, this guy, I just shook my head. As I'm walking in, all the guys are sat down ready to have, have watched the film from last night. And he said, stop the tape. He said, I just told Greg not to F you. And I looked at him, I said, okay. All right, I see what we are now. And from that point on, I made an effort to try to to try to hurt players in our practice. I literally tried to hurt Ron Mercer. I tried to hurt Antoine Walker. I tried to hurt <laughs> anyone when they went up for a dunk or when they went up, not dunk, but for a layup. If I caught him in the air, I tried to took my, I took my forearm. I tried to cave that chest in because at that particular time, I was like the enforcer. I was one of the older guys on the team and he was trying to be so disruptive to, to, not only from a, from a player standpoint to all the things he knew my story, he could have helped in so many ways, and yet, yeah, we bumped head. That's one of the reasons why I never came back to U of L was because mm. of that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In 1999, you had a hip injury, a career-ending hip injury. What happened? And at the time, did you know it was going to be career ending or was it something that kind of came when the doctor said, you know, it's more serious than what we thought? Because sometimes, you know, people can have injuries and they'd be like, oh, man, I pulled a muscle or, you know, it, you may not know what it is, but you just know that you're in pain. But, you know, when the doctor came back, he said, well, I don't know if you're going to be able to play basketball again. Right. Well, it was a week left to go in the season. And um, at this, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on. You know, Tina and I, our relationship, uh, there was stuff going on off the floor, I mean, off the court, you know, in my personal life, you know, going through this child custody stuff and painting a picture of being a certain way. And then you trying to navigate through that. I didn't have any legal advice. It was my, my ex, who was, um, Steph, who was, um, um, really inspirational in terms of keeping my head level, keeping me focused on things. And uh, um, so which leads up to that last week in the season, because it was only a week left to go. We were in Miami and there was a shock. We were on defense and uh, the Heat, they, 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 they had a possession and we were switching from defense to offense. Um, we were giving it a go in transition, Dan Marley, jumped in my path. When he jumped in my path to try to cut me off, I tried to go around it. When I did, I, I planted wrong. So my, the ball and the femur went out of socket, mm. land in a certain way and went on the compact of my land because I was a big guy at the time before I planted the, the shooting guard. So I was probably about two, 240, 245. And um, I landed, and when I landed, the bone chipped off my hip. And that's where the problem came. And so I knew immediately something was, you know, because I never felt any pain like that before in my life. I had broken bones before in my foot and my hand and twice my foot and my hand and sprained ankles and all this stuff. But that was a different type of pain. And so I laid there and they brought out a stretcher. And when it was a stretcher, it was a next thing you know, I'm being carted into the heat locker room. And people don't really, I don't know if people know, it's probably some of my close friends, but I was getting ready to get traded. I was about to be a heat. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to get back. I'm going to get traded all season. I'm going to be with Morning, Hardaway, Marley, and that group. That's where I was getting ready to go ahead. It was, it was a done deal. And lo and behold, I'm in the hospital and I read in the, another month, maybe two months later, not the team now. I read in the paper that my career was over. Wow. So you hadn't even talked to the doctors or anything. You found no. out the same time everybody I, else found out. Yeah, so I'm reading the paper. I'm like, what are you talking about, my team? So then I get Arnie, and I spoke to Arnie, and I said, hey, see, that's the way, that's, that's the kind of relationship that Rick and I had. He wanted to, he wanted to isolate me from everybody else. 
That's how bad it was. So it was one of those deals where I'm reading this in the paper. Only I say out of all of the guys that that was on that team, only one came to visit. That was Dana Barrows. And then ex ex general manager ML Carr. So I was like, wow, it's really like I'm really all, all on my own. So that's basically what happened. I um uh, spent three months in the hospital on my back and went home on crutches and slowly moved after that. I want to say like a couple months after that, I moved to Orlando and that's where my life started, you know, started rebuilding my life over again. Okay. So it wasn't similar to like, was it a, was that a, like a Bo Jackson type of injury to the hip? It's like same exact injury. Same exact injury. Same, same exact injury. So what's happening is like where the ball meet the femur, there's like a little muscle that connect the two. Mm -hmm. That, that muscle or ligament, whatever you want to call it, it's, it, it's, it was torn. And mm -hmm. now it's like bone on bone. It's just grinding and grinding. And it's oh, called man. it coming off rise. Yeah. Mm. That's basically mm. where it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well, so that's, that's why I would say to kids all the time, you know, when you play our players, you must, it's not like an, an on the court thing. It's got to be something where you got to balance both. You can't have a lot of, outside distractions, you gotta be, you know, make sure you stretch, you know. Um, whereas I didn't do a lot of that and I let all this outside distraction um, get the best of me. And so it affected me on my play. And it didn't help when they had your, 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 you didn't have any support system from your team. Right. So it was just like, you know, yeah. Right. And so after your playing career, you got into coaching. You've coached in the G League, you mentioned you've coached in China. How has your experience been going into to the coaching world? And, you know, having, having so much experience from playing and, and playing at the highest level? Well, um, you know, it's, I, I listen to, like, with all this current events that have gone on, um, there are, like, three or four coaches that are currently playing in the playoffs, are coaching in the playoffs, um, that I coached against in the D League, a G League. It was the D League back right then. That's the well. They're not there. The Utah staff was there. You know, I, I coached against Quinn. I used to work for Alex. Alex is Alex Jensen. Alex is um <clears throat> is, is um, one of the assistant coaches for the Jazz. I coached against I coached against Nick, Nick Nurse. So I had a very good. Um, it was very good. It was a very good experience. And basically, what I tried to pay my way because of my time at the during those times, Dan Fagan, who was my agent. Um, was more focus on, you know, the current players. And so I went, I took coaches seminar. I went to Secaucus, New Jersey, and I learned from Doug Collins and some of the other coaches that had been around for a while, mm -hmm. what to do. And then um, I took, I went up with basketball without borders. And so that's what my Chinese connection, that's how I started to, um, um, that's why I was able to navigate over there because I had been over there with the NBA. So I had worked camps and clinics over there, uh, like five or six different cities. And so when my first opportunity came, is when I came back from Kuwait, I had went over to, to, uh, to entertain the troops. And after that, I got a phone call from Otis Burson, um, an uh, ex-NBA player who was a general manager of the CBA. So when the CBA came around, um, we won a championship that year, championship that year. We coached against a guy named Paul Wooper, who was at Sy um, Yakima. Yakima was a, it's a story. Um, it's a very famous franchise in, in, in for the CBA. They have won. It's like, I don't know, they're like the Warriors, let's say, uh, um, back, in, back in the CBA. Um, mm -hmm. Well, Paul was very respectful, very... Uh, Good, you know, good guy, good hard nosed coach. So I coached against him after one of the guys, I thought our head coach got uh, got ejected for a game, Michael Ray Richardson. I don't know if you know who he is. Uh, Michael Ray I heard Otis. the name. I can't really put a face with it. I, I've heard the name before, though. Well, Michael in a plan overseas for many years. He was in the era with um, 
Isaiah Thomas, Magic Johnson, that group. He's probably about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and there's a lot of documentary on him about how he went in, starts talking smack in the visitor locker room and go out and do it. He was just that good. Mm-hmm. And he got banded from the league because of truckies. And so he spent, played up to like in the mid forties overseas in France. The guy is, he's phenomenal. He was phenomenal, phenomenal. But he's, he has a problem sometimes with controlling the temperature, the temperature, his temper during games. And so this particular game, he got ejected and I coached against Paul. And we won that game and we ended up winning the series. So Paul remembered me, but also I'm friends with Troy Weaver. And so what happened was I ended up getting drafted. I ended up getting, not drafted, but ended up getting uh, interviewed by the Thunder, which is my first team. And Paul had this rapport with me. Troy used to train me and now I'm with OKC. And I got a chance. That was when Russell was a rookie. Russell Westbrook was a rookie. Earl, Earl uh, Watson was there. Duran, Jeff Green, that group. So mm-hmm. she was a was a rookie too. So I worked with a lot of those guys. I helped train them in doing um, doing that um, that year, and I bounced around. So um, the G League, uh, D League is good. It's a grind. Um, one of the things for sure that I, you know working with an NBA franchise is better than just working during those times because there are some teams that didn't have it. And, working with the NBA franchise is the way you want it to go because now that, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, trying to, I won't say raise money, but in some cases, some teams did, but, um, but you, um, things were like, you didn't have to worry about travel arrangements because the team will, will have that all in all set. Right. All you have to do is just worry about work and, and all those things. So the my experience was good, but I went from, I went from year to year from different teams. So I worked for five different teams um, during, those year, during those years of in the G League, um, OKC, Golden State, uh, Clippers, Portland, and then my last one was with Cleveland. And so that was, that was a good experience. And when I say grind, we're waking up at 4, 4, 4 30 in the morning, you're catching flights, and you may land in the middle of a small airport in some other city and now you're busing maybe two hours to somewhere else <laughs> it was crazy but you know you did you had to do what you had to do if you want to climb up the coaching tree but i never got a chance to do it because i felt like it was like um, you know some people look at your resume and they feel like oh he does have have this list or type this so when i say like current affairs i'm talking about systematic racism that's basically what i'm talking about because a lot of the guys that i worked with before I felt like I was better because and I'm not saying it because I was aware, prepared, well equipped what it was going to do. It was all about me just getting an opportunity. Right. And so I'm working with teams where I have seen teams before um, where the head coach get promoted to say working with the NBA team now full time and they bring in the assistant coach as the head coach. That never happened in my, on my account. But I watch a lot of other guys get that, that opportunity. So I ended up going over to China, and the teams that I worked with there was not the CBA; it was a league below that, like the G League. Mm-hmm. Um, but the monies were was really good, and my, t- my players were okay. And I think that team had their best uh, opportunities when I was under under my watch, um, mainly because there's a couple things yet yeah, people have to I have to well coach had to consider. One, the lifestyle there. China, China is not for everybody, you know, under the living conditions and the food and all that stuff. By me being a pescatarian, um, and I've been months without even eating fish, it worked out well for me. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> other guys, like uh, one of my friends, I, you know, he's no longer here with us, uh, Sean Rooks. Uh, he probably, he only stayed a month. And then I'm saying, um, Dean Martin only stayed a month these guys that worked in the D league with me. Right. So it was, um, it was a, it was a good experience. I learned how to get around in Mandarin. I never thought I could speak a Mandarin the Chinese a little bit, but I, I nice. can do that as well. <laughs> nice. Now, but, now uh, what are some, what are some philosophies that you've taken from some of the past coaches? Cause you've played for some hall of fame coaches. What are some philosophies that you've taken from some of them that you may implement into your own coaching style? You know, as much as I, as much as Rick and I bumped heads, 
I took a lot of a lot of this in terms of his his work ethic. You know, when from from an individual standpoint, you know how to train, how to you know, even from from an eating um, from the foods I intake. Because in one way I was thinking I was doing things this way when I was when I had to redirect and start doing it's completely different. So uh, health and fitness I took from him. Um, Danny, I took like I guess the way you communicate with players, because he was more laid back and he had a way of teaching where it was calming and soothing, and he, he got the message. Um, and then the other ones like you know, been hanging around with Billy Donovan or because when I and then one of the things I failed to mention when I really started getting into coaching, I would go to all these different universities and watch how they train, how they prepare their practices. So when I was um, a couple of years there, I went to like a lot of schools in Florida to see what, you know, call the head coach, hey, I just want to send in the prices to see what's going on. And that's what I would do. And so, and I picked that brain a little bit here and there and asked them like questions or, you know, certain drills, what these drills do or, or and um, they were more than, more than helpful. So I just took the bits and pieces of information from everyone. Um, and then I watched, you know, from afar and I, if, if there are certain players that I knew, and I, I asked, I say, what, what is Spockovich is like? What, what is his style like? You know, or what, even with Alex, Alex worked with Rick, Rick Majerus. He had like a way that Rick Majerus teaches. Like he would have like all these, these little pieces of papers just ripped around the wall and had offense over here, and defense over here, and he didn't have all this stuff and, in the G League. But if you came in our locker room and I worked with the Cavaliers, you would see paper all over the place. And that's how Majerus kind of do his the, the same. And he had like certain drills he do. So you kind of, you sort of, for me, I sort of learned from um, different coaches doing different periods. And I keep it, even to this day, I, I still keep evolving. Like I, the way I train now, the way I train our kids here in, in, in Los Angeles is completely different than I did maybe like five or six years ago. Nice, nice. And so now, G, we've reached a part of the podcast we call our burn proof segment of rapid fire questions. Man, we're gonna shoot you some some questions. Don't give it a lot of thought. Just give us your okay. first answer. We're gonna roll with it. All right, sounds good. Cool. <laughs> your favorite cereal as a kid? Fruity Pebbles. My man, <laughs> my man. <laughs> the the best defender you've ever played against. Who is the best defender? Pippen. Mm, yeah, might be in conversation of all time. If there was an actor to play the life of Greg Miner, who would it be? Oh, man, you set me up. I can't do that one. Uh, ooh. That's a good question. I keep saying Samuel Jackson, but I don't Samuel. want to go <laughs> You definitely, you definitely <laughs> got the voice. You definitely got the voice. <laughs> if you and Dwayne Morton were a rap duo, what would your name be? Eminem. <laughs> Minor and Morton. I like it. I like it. I like it. <laughs> two of my favorite, two of two of my favorite combos on the wing, man. Jagged, <laughs> jagged edge or one twelve. Yeah, that's tough. I like them both, man. That's, I can't. It's 112. I go with 112. 112? Ooh, I thought you might have went with the home team from the from the from the GA. Thought you might have went uh, with I Jagged Edge. <laughs> 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 All right. Now this is a question that we call franchise sign and wave. You got a franchise a guy that you're gonna build your team around. You gotta sign a guy that you're gonna keep on your team. You gotta wave a guy that you can't keep that you can't keep. So you got Steve Nash, Chris Paul, Jason Kidd. Who you franchising? Who you signing? Who you waving? That's tough, man. That's tough. <sighs> Steve Nash, Chris Paul, Jason Kidd. I think I'm going with signing. Who you building your Chris franchise Paul. around? 
I don't think I'm signing Chris Paul building franchise with Jason Kidd, Waven Nash. Waven Nash. The reason why I say this, I'm saying this because from a defensive perspective too, that I'm looking at both ends. So um, if the game was played the way it was played when I was during my era, that's what I would do. Now, uh, if, if it's playing modern day, then I have to write Jason because now I'm looking at off of those two, Paul and Nash, they are like offense, they can, they can score. They have better jump shots than, than Kit. But I'm, I'm, the way I'm structured, I'm, I'm, stru- I'm structuring it from my era. By yeah. saying, they, they, they both are better defense. They're like pit bulls on the defensive end. So it calls having on both ends of the floor, regardless of the jump, where they're they yeah. outside. What 1990s fashion brand would you wear in 